Hey, what's up guys? I'm back with another book review and in this video I will be reviewing Under the Surface by Grandmaster Jan Marcos. Uh, this was published uh, by Quality Chess back in 2018 and I've actually had my eye on this book for a while. This review is honestly uh, long overdue. Uh, I was very interested in the book when it first came out, but I didn't actually end up reading it until we selected it for our dojo book club that I did with Grandmaster Jesse Cry. Now the two of us really enjoyed this book and myself personally, I, I just had a great time reading it. I found a lot of incredibly useful uh, content and examples in the book. And uh, while I do think this book will be kind of more useful for some players than others, I think overall it's a very, very accessible book. And if you enjoy reading about chess and if you have the funds, of course, uh, I would recommend that you go ahead and buy it. I really think it's it's that good. In fact, when I ranked the best modern books uh, with our friend International Master Andres Toth, I hadn't quite finished this book yet, so I didn't feel comfortable ranking it. But if I could redo my list today, I would definitely include it somewhere in, in my top three. I really did like it and, and enjoy it that much. So what is this book about? Well, like the title suggests, Under the Surface, uh, the author kind of goes into some of the deeper insights about the game and tries to really uncover things uh, that are not obvious that you wouldn't find in, in other books. Uh, I would say that the book mainly focuses on strategic decision making, you know, how to develop plans at the chessboard and how to decide, you know, what to do with your pieces, what to do with your pawns and, and things of this nature. And what I mainly like about the book is that the author just uses a ton of original examples, games that you won't find in other books, including lots of examples from really modern players, a lot of games from Carlson in here, Caruana, uh, David Navarra has a few nice games, and a few games from the author himself, who in his own right is a very strong player. Um, and he really breaks down, you know, how he made certain decisions at the board and, and what kind of things he was thinking during the game, what kind of games he himself was recalling when he was kind of coming up with ideas uh, and making decisions, which, which I felt was really, really instructive. So the book is divided into seven parts and each of the parts I would say uh, are quite uh, distinct. There's a, a part on how to use your pieces most effectively. There's a part on how to manage time during the game and not so much time as the time on your clock, but rather you know differentiating between positions that are dynamic and require fast play versus positions that are more closed and strategic and that require slow play. Uh, there's also a section on openings here where he doesn't go into like you know what openings to play or give any uh, super concrete variations but rather discusses a little bit about how you know grandmaster choose their openings what kind of positions you should be trying to get from the opening and kind of things uh, of this fashion uh, there's also a very interesting part uh, about engines and what are some of their strengths, what are some of their weaknesses, what we can learn from some modern engines, uh, which personally I just found really fascinating as well. Each part is divided into several chapters, and what I really liked is that none of the chapters are, are too long. They kind of read just like a really well-written article, uh, so you can actually uh, read different parts of the book. You don't have to go through it uh, start to finish. So you can just start with the sections that are most interesting to you. And while there's a lot of really practical insights in the book about decision making and how to actually manage your clock and what kinds of things you should be thinking about uh, during the chessboard, the book gets into some really deeper stuff, almost as if the author you know, is trying to uncover some truth about the, the metaphysics uh, of the chessboard. And he really gets you to think about the game uh, in, in a different way. Even myself being you know, a reasonably strong player, uh, I, I found a lot of stuff in this book that maybe I was doing subconsciously and not even thinking about it, but putting it into conscious words I, I think is really, really uh, instructive. And if it was that useful for me, I can only imagine how useful it might be for kind of the average club player reading this book. One of my favorite chapters in the book uh, is this one called Anatoly Karpov's Billiard Balls, which actually uh, refers to a quote by Karpov when he, where he compares the bishops uh, to billiard balls uh, on the pool table. Uh, and the point he's trying to make is that bishops actually have very difficult time uh, getting from one side of the board to the other. They have to kind of bounce off the chessboard in order to reach a different part of the board, similar to like billiard balls on, on a pool table. Uh, and I found this actually uh, quite insightful because 
Um, the practical application here is that you should be very careful about where you develop your bishops uh, in the opening and where they end up in the middle game. Because if they end up on the wrong side of the board, they might not be able to help you when the actual fight takes place on the other side. One of the examples Marcos uses uh, to illustrate this is this game between Carlson and Bacro uh, back from 2010. This comes out of a scotch opening and I actually found this one uh, to be quite interesting. Uh, in this position, Black plays the move knight to d4. And nowadays, this has actually become, I think, some kind of uh, mainline theory. But back in 2010, I don't think this line was established yet, which makes Carlson's decision kind of even, uh, even more interesting. And, and here after knight d4, I think most players would go ahead and just trade on d4. Uh, takes Bishop takes d4. But instead, Carlson plays this move queen to d3, just attacking the knight and letting black double white's pawns on the b3 square, which feels like a serious uh, weakening, especially since white's king is probably going to be castling queenside in this position. Uh, but as Marcos explains, the point of this one is simply not to let the bishop back into the game via d4 square, uh, where it can defend the knight on f6. Um, now, if I was just analyzing this game on my own, and you know, I checked it with the engine because I was curious, I would actually think this is more of a concrete decision because after knight takes d4, bishop takes d4, black is starting to take on c3 and, and wreck white's pawns, and if white plays queen to d3, black can actually go ahead and take on c3 anyway. White doesn't really want to take bc, but the point is if queen takes c3, black has this trick with knight takes e4, winning a pawn, both queens are hanging, but the tactics end up working out for black, and black is uh, even better in this case. Now, if I was just analyzing this game on my own, I'd be thinking like, oh, it's a concrete thing. You know, that's why white doesn't trade on d4 and plays queen to d3. And while that may be the main reason, uh, I should what I wouldn't notice myself is that after the move bishop to e5, black is also fine in this case. And, and this goes back to the point uh, of the chapter is that the bishop is now able to fight on the king side, dealing with white's pin on this diagonal. And here the bishop, of course, is much better placed. Going to the game after knight d4, queen d3, black takes on b3, plays rook to e8, and after the next couple of moves, it becomes very apparent that this pin is super annoying for black's position, and the bishop on b6 is really missed on the king side, for example, on this e7 square or on the e5 square. Of course, black doesn't really want to play uh, g5 here because that would just weaken the king side way too much, and after just a couple of moves, Magnus ends up breaking with e5, a really strong decision, takes rook takes e5, and now because of the threat of uh, knight to d5, black is forced to kind of get his queen out of the way with the move queen to f8, allowing white to take on f6 and just totally ruin black structure on the king side. And Magnus goes on to win uh, this uh, with a mating attack uh, a little bit down the line. So a super interesting example, one of a, a few examples uh, in the chapter, and just kind of shows that you know, he uncovers a lot of these kind of deeper points uh, about the game that really would not be obvious if uh, you were just kind of analyzing these games yourself. So let's talk about who this book uh, I think would be the most useful for. Uh, like I mentioned uh, at the beginning of the video, I think pretty much anyone could get this book and, and get something out of it. Um, but I would say that it's probably going to be most useful and most instructive for uh, the more advanced range, let's say 1600 feet, 1800 feet and up. Now it doesn't mean that players below that range are not gonna get anything out of the book. I think it's quite accessible. I just think the book doesn't really delve into uh, the basics so much, like you know how to calculate lines, how to spot tactics, how to avoid blundering your pieces, how to defend your king, how to promote pass pawns uh, in the end game it kind of goes into deeper strategic insights that i think are really interesting and really useful but again it's not going to kind of teach you the absolute fundamentals of the game so if you only have like one hour to study chess every day this book might not be the absolute best use of your time i would say that time is probably better spent you know playing and, and solving puzzles but if you do have time if you do enjoy reading about the game and you find a lot of uh, interest in chess then i, I think you're really just going to enjoy the 
the book regardless uh, of your level. And there's so much content in this book that I feel like you could come back to it and reread it multiple times and get something uh, new from it each time. In fact, rereading this book when I was uh, preparing for this review, I noticed so many examples that I had forgotten from when I had originally read this book uh, the first time. So this is definitely a book that you can read multiple times over and really get something out of it uh, every single time. So yeah, if you have the budget and are looking for a new interesting book to read, one that you don't necessarily have to uh, read while playing it out on a chessboard, you can definitely read this like on a train or, or while you're on the go. Uh, I would say this is a really, really good choice. Last I checked, it's something like uh, $25. And I mean, for that cost, like I think it would take like many months, if not years of private lessons to kind of get the same material that you would get out of this one book. Of course, you have to do the work yourself and read it, but ultimately I do think it's uh, fully worth it. So that's gonna wrap it up for this video. Uh, if you guys enjoyed it, please let me know in the comment section below. And uh, if you want to see more book reviews in the future, make sure to leave a thumbs up on the video. Uh, if you haven't subscribed to the channel, please do so. We really appreciate it. And I think that's going to be it. So until next time, take care.